Peter wrote about the Apostle Paul's letters warning, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. So the truth is, some people twist Paul's letters along with the rest of the Scriptures to fit their own personal agenda, theology, or preconceived conclusions. And Peter called those who do this terrible sin of twisting God's holy word untaught and unstable. They may twist Paul's words about the law that specifically had to do with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances like circumcision, in an attempt to use those words to throw out the moral laws of our God. Or they may twist Paul's words about foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances, in an attempt to pretend that those things still matter to God in the New Covenant. But either way, we will be able to spot both types of twisting by the description untaught and unstable. Now the word Peter used that we translate as untaught is amethase, which means unlearned or ignorant, while the word Peter used that we translate as unstable is asterictos, which means unfixed and vacillating or even inconsistent. In the way all sound Bible scholars carefully avoid being ignorant, unfixed, and inconsistent with the way they handle the scriptures is, they develop an educated, consistent, harmonious, fixed method of interpreting the Bible that they call their hermeneutic. And a sound hermeneutic will read every verse of scripture in the same educated, consistent, harmonious way, regardless of whether the passage says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, or if in the context of food it declares, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. And with this in mind, Exactly ten months ago, we looked very carefully at how Jesus and his apostles and disciples interpreted the scriptures, and we developed an educated, careful, consistent, harmonious, fixed method of interpreting the Bible based on scripture alone. Therefore, before we move on to consider more of what the apostles and disciples of our Lord wrote about the foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances of the First Covenant, we need to pause to consider exactly what hermeneutic we have used as we have interpreted the passages we have studied so far. And I ask you all to judge today if I have been consistently following the interpretational method of Jesus and his apostles and disciples. In six individual sermons over the last few months, we have looked at, for example, the diet God gave Adam and Eve, the diet God gave Noah, the diet God gave Israel, the dietary changes God announced to Peter, and the dietary conclusions of the Jerusalem Council in Acts. However, we have documented as we studied the passages of the Bible that discuss those diets, that there are certain teachers who challenge the plain wording of Genesis chapter 9, allegorize Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10, and contradict the conclusions of the apostles and elders in Acts chapter 15. So, with all we have learned so far about Genesis 9, Acts 10, and Acts 15 in mind, let us remember that our foundational principle in every category of biblical study is Jesus, our Messiah, is the key to properly understanding the Word of God.
And today, we remind ourselves that our second standard of biblical interpretation is the writings of the apostles and disciples of Jesus also reveal the Messiah's infallible understanding of the Word of God. Plus, today, we remember that our third standard of biblical interpretation is we must never set aside a single word of the Holy Scriptures unless Jesus or his apostles clearly and indisputably set it aside. Yes, the writings of our Messiah's apostles and disciples reveal how we must approach biblical interpretation or hermeneutics. So let's go back and look again at a passage where Jesus quotes from the first 39 books of the Bible in the final 27 to remind ourselves how our omniscient king interpreted Holy Scripture. Matthew recorded, The Pharisees also came to Jesus, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Here Jesus quoted the Septuagint word for word while asking the Pharisees if they had even read in Scripture how God instituted marriage in the beginning. And the second time Jesus quoted the exact Greek wording of the Septuagint, he quoted Genesis 1.27. But the Messiah made a direct connection between verse 27 and verse 1 of the first chapter of Genesis when he said that God made male and female humans in his own image at, from, or since the beginning. The verse Jesus quoted from says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. But many theologians in our modern world would claim that verse 27 occurred long after the beginning. They might say that each day of creation was a long period of time, or that there was a long gap between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. But Jesus just made an inseparable connection between verse 1 that says, in the beginning, and verse 27 that says, God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. To understand how profound that connection really is, please consider the genealogy of the Messiah given to us by Luke. In the third chapter of Luke's Gospel, a direct lineage from Adam to Jesus is given, and there are 75 human fathers listed. If we assume an average age of 120 years when each son was born to his father, a very conservatively high average estimate, that means that there cannot be more than 9,000 years between the birth of Jesus and the creation of Adam. In fact, Septuagint-based calculations reveal that 30 AD was the equivalent of 5,367 years after Adam was created. If a person accepts the day-age theory that claims each day of creation was a vast period of time, or if a person accepts the gap theory that claims a massive period of time passed between the first and second verse of Genesis, then verse 27 when God created man in his own image, could never be considered the beginning as Jesus said it was. No, those two theories would place verse 27 of chapter 1 more towards the middle of the history of the universe, or even the end. So already we begin to see how profoundly the words of Jesus should impact our reading of Scripture. The Messiah said 
God created man in his own image from the beginning, and that should settle all debates about the reading of Genesis once and for all. And at this point, we must recall our fourth principle of interpretation, which is the simplest, most straightforward reading of Scripture is the reading Jesus always taught. And another example of that principle can be seen in Matthew chapter 24. There Jesus said, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Based on this passage, could anyone honestly argue that Jesus thought the flood was a non-literal moral allegory? Plus, if someone wrongly treats Noah and the flood as a moral allegory, will they treat the second coming of Jesus as a moral allegory too? The fact is that Jesus considered Noah a real historical figure who literally entered a physical ark and survived a literal flood that took all of the people who did not enter that ark with Noah away. And he compared that literal historical account to how things would be when he literally returned to the earth. And because Jesus took the flood so literally, his apostles took it literally too. After spending almost every waking moment with the Messiah for nearly three years, Peter wrote, God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. None of us could ever hope to know more about how the Messiah perceived the scriptures than the Apostle Peter, and Peter wrote that the entire ancient world was destroyed by a flood, and only Noah and seven others were saved on the ark. Peter did not teach a local flood, a metaphorical flood, or an allegorical flood. Peter taught a literal global catastrophic flood that destroyed the ancient world. Or, in other words, Peter was taught by Jesus to believe in a literal, plain sense interpretation of the Holy Scriptures that accepted exactly what the Scriptures said in an honest, straightforward way. So our fifth principle of interpretation that we have carefully followed over the last six sermons is the most literal reading of Scripture that still makes sense in the context is the reading that Jesus always taught. And we can see our fourth and fifth principles in action as we look at how the apostles and disciples of our Lord viewed Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. In Luke 3.38, Adam is listed as the first human in the Messiah's earthly ancestry, and that same Adam is mentioned by the Apostle Paul in his inspired first letter to Timothy. Paul wrote, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. And in another letter to the church in Corinth, Paul wrote, I fear lest... Somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Modern theologians may find it fashionable to doubt the historicity of Adam and Eve, or even the serpent's temptation of Eve in the garden. But the apostles of our Lord did not doubt those realities in any way. They based their understanding of the Messiah's genealogy on a literal Adam. They based their understanding of authority, submission, and gender on a literal interpretation of Genesis 
and they referred to the book of Genesis as literal, reliable, and even infallible history that set the stage for every major doctrine and principle that came after it. And now that we have a few reminders of how Jesus and his apostles interpreted Scripture under our belt, I want to pick up on a word we just read in the writings of Paul that's the key to biblical interpretation and the Messiah's approach to the Bible. And that key word is submission. You see, there are basically two types of people in this world. Those who seek to submit their every whim, wish, and perception to every single blessed word of the Holy Bible. Or those who wish to submit every single blessed word of the Holy Bible to their own whims, wishes, and perceptions. When we approach the Bible with a spirit of submission, we approach it correctly, in the way Jesus and his apostles and disciples approached it. But when we approach the Bible with an agenda, or with a spirit of pride or rebellion, we will try to make the Bible submit to us. And these two opposing spirits, the spirit of humble submission to the inspired words of God, as opposed to the spirit of pride and rebellion against the plainly inspired words of God, have been warring against each other since the Garden of Eden. One is the Holy Spirit of the Messiah, and the other is the unholy spirit of Satan. Please note, the spirit of holy submission in the words of our Messiah who said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his command is eternal life. Therefore whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. And in another place he said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Brothers and sisters, the reason that Jesus never sinned is because he never said anything or did anything that contradicted his Father's will. He perfectly and willingly submitted himself to every single word that proceeded from his Father, and he has instructed us to do the same. And this leads us to our sixth principle of interpretation, which is the most humble and submissive reading of Scripture is the reading Jesus always taught. But Satan always tries to twist God's Word and tempt us to violate it. And this epic battle between God's Word, Satan's lies, and our free will is the story of mankind. But please make no mistake, this saga has a direct impact on the history of biblical interpretation. Just as Satan deceptively whispered to Eve in the garden, has God indeed said, and you will not surely die, to cause her to question and even reject the truth of God's word, Satan still whispers similar lies to theologians to tempt them to look at things according to their own fallen and fleshly perspective. And just as Eve began to evaluate her world according to her own perspective, we fall when we interpret the Bible with any external perspective that contradicts the literal plain sense perspective the Holy Scriptures present. Or said another way, we must allow Scripture to speak for itself. We must interpret Scripture with Scripture, and we must constantly adapt our perspective to match God's perspective as it is plainly presented. Because if we don't, we will philosophically add to 
or take away from God's word in ways that are just as dangerous as the cults that add to or take away from the 66 books of the Holy Bible. In the first century, cults like the Sadducees and the Samaritans only believed the books of Moses were Holy Scripture, and Jesus openly rebuked them for that error. And in our century, groups like the Mormons or the Catholics are labeled as cults by many because they add to and take away from Scripture. But we can philosophically do the same thing when we arbitrarily label Peter's vision as symbolic or say things like Peter's vision had nothing to do with food. As we have noted, a symbolic vision of animals in a sheet would not include a command to rise, kill, and eat. And nowhere in Scripture is an interpretation given for Peter's vision that lays out what the animals were symbolically representing or what the commands really meant. Plus, Peter obviously thought the vision of the animals in the sheet, along with the command to rise, kill, and eat, was about food, since he replied, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And any honest reading of Acts chapter 11 will acknowledge that Peter's answer to the complaint, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them, recorded Peter referring to the vision along with the filling of the Gentiles with the Holy Spirit, to justify his eating with the Gentiles. So, Scripture itself will always eliminate man's faulty interpretations if we handle it honestly and thoroughly while seeking the truth with childlike trust. And this is why the Messiah so frequently asked, Have you not read? And essentially warned, you are mistaken due to a lack of knowledge in the scriptures. And this leads us to our seventh principle of interpretation, which is the most harmonious, all-inclusive, and comprehensive reading of scripture is the reading Jesus always taught. When the Pharisees focused exclusively on Deuteronomy 24, where Moses introduced the exception of premarital fornication that permitted divorce, and they tried to expand that exception to include other reasons, Jesus focused their attention back on God's original design of marriage in Genesis and then restated the very narrow exception that Moses originally intended. When the Pharisees tried to place new restrictions on the Sabbath that made it a burden instead of a day of peace and rest, Jesus directed them to the real heart of God revealed in Scripture. He reminded them about David and his hungry men eating the showbread only the priests could lawfully eat, the priests serving God and even the needs of the people in the temple on the Sabbath, and how it was lawful to help a suffering animal on the Sabbath, all to show them that God sees showing mercy and eliminating the urgent needs of others on the Sabbath as right, good, and lawful. Matthew recorded that Jesus surveyed Scripture to show how God wants all of his creation to be able to rest on his holy Sabbath, including the hungry, the trapped, the suffering, and the afflicted. And the Gospels record that Jesus taught and demonstrated mercy and loving kindness by setting people free from their burdens on the Sabbath so they could rest as God intended. And the Gospels also record when the Sadducees tried to prove their incorrect view that there was no resurrection, they asked Jesus a question about a woman who married seven brothers and they pretended to wonder which of the seven brothers she would be the wife of after the resurrection. And because the Sadducees only accepted the five books of Moses as authoritative scripture, Jesus chose to correct them with a passage from Exodus. He said, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, 
They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Hundreds of years after the death of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God told Moses, I am, in the present tense, their God. He didn't say he was their God. And on the tense of that verb, Jesus proved, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And this leads us to our eighth principle of interpretation, which is, every single word that proceeds from the mouth of God should be at least as important to us as food, and a precise and careful reading of Scripture is the reading Jesus always taught. After fasting for 40 days, Scripture records Jesus was hungry, and at that moment the devil said to our Lord, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Not only is Jesus relying on Deuteronomy here to authoritatively resist the devil, he is using this passage in the most straightforward, literal, submissive, harmonious, and precise way possible. And the Messiah's three interactions with the devil in the wilderness confirm principles 4 through 8 very clearly. The Messiah quoted the words of Moses exactly as they were written in the Septuagint's record of Exodus. He didn't twist them or modify them from the straightforward way they were written. The Messiah applied the words of Moses about the people being tested, caused to hunger, and eventually receiving manna in the wilderness to his situation of being tested, caused to hunger and waiting for his father to feed him in his own timing in the most literal way possible. The Messiah submitted to that literal, straightforward reading that perfectly paralleled his situation, and he refused to use his own power to feed himself before the father chose to feed him. The Messiah chose the verse that most directly harmonized with his hungry situation. Plus, in his second temptation, when the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus harmonized all of the word of God together to find the most appropriate verse and said, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And the Messiah precisely rested his final reply to Satan on one single word when the devil said, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus replied, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And the single word this very precise rebuttal rests on is the four-letter word only in English, or M-O-N-O -O in Greek. So Jesus taught and demonstrated that we must pay attention to every little word that proceeds from the mouth of our God while we apply all of the other rules of interpretation we have learned so far. And now that we understand how a firm foundation of interpretation must begin with a very straightforward, literal, submissive, harmonious, precise approach, we're ready to learn about our ninth principle of interpretation, which is a sequential reading of Scripture that recognizes the principle of progressive revelation is the reading Jesus always taught.
Jesus once told his disciples, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. The fact is the Creator has intentionally revealed the truth of His Word to His creation in a very systematic way over several thousand years, so that each revelation built on the principles established by the revelations that came before it, and we call this process progressive revelation. We can imagine how progressive revelation works by picturing one of the Lord's parables. In his parables, Jesus used common, everyday realities, like sowing seed onto different soils, to help us understand the spiritual realities behind the various ways people receive his word. We can all understand how birds can steal away seed from a pathway, how rocky soil can prevent roots from growing, how weedy soil can choke out a plant so that it cannot produce fruit, and how the best soil is the kind that produces the fruit we planted the seed to receive. And our shepherd used this simple picture that we could easily relate to to show us how we must receive his word, allow it to root deeply into our hearts, pull the spiritual weeds that hinder fruit growth, and bear fruit in obedient patience. And just as the Messiah used earthly pictures like this one to teach us deeper spiritual realities, he used earthly pictures in the first covenant to teach us how to understand the new covenant. This does not mean that the history, principles, commandments, and situations of the first covenant are not to be understood as historically literal, morally literal, or implicationally literal. It simply means that we can also see them as typologically or parabolically literal. In other words, a man named Joseph truly did exist, and his brothers literally did betray him and seek to destroy him. And through their betrayal, Joseph ultimately ascended to the right hand of the most powerful ruler on earth at that time and saved his people during a great famine. But all of these real-life circumstances were actually foreshadowing the Messiah's betrayal by his ancestral brothers, his ascension after that betrayal to the right hand of the Father in heaven, and his ability to save his people if they would only come to him in repentance, as Joseph's brothers came to him. These types, or parables, fill the pages of the first 39 books of the Bible, and men like Moses, Joshua, and David are meant to point us to the Messiah, the ultimate revelation of God to mankind. And the first covenant that began at Passover, when the people were set free by the blood of a lamb slain on the fourteenth day of the first month, pointed forward to the new covenant that began at Passover, when the true Passover lamb was slain on the fourteenth day of the first month. And every event commemorated in the feast cycle of the first covenant represents a very specific messianic event in the new covenant in the Messiah's blood. Truly, just as the people were set free from their slavery in Egypt in the first covenant, we are set free from our slavery to sin in the new covenant. But Jesus mediates the new covenant in the place of Aaron and Moses, and he serves as high priest of a better covenant in a better tabernacle in the heavens. So we must understand, Jesus didn't come to tear down or set aside the shadows and types of the first covenant, he came to fill them to the full and reveal the deeper truths they always pointed to in God's divine plan of progressive revelation. And we must not look at the first 39 books of the Holy Bible as no longer directly relevant. 
Instead, we must see them as the framework required to properly understand the glorious revelations of the final 27 books. And we can only set aside those things the Lord and his disciples indisputably set aside in the pages of Holy Scripture, such as the foods, drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances of the first covenant that were imposed until the time of Reformation. And this passage in Hebrews reveals that there are two different forms of progressive revelation. There is the type of progressive revelation that adds to and builds on top of the foundations established in the first 39 books. And there are a few very specific items within the earlier revelation of the first 39 books that were only imposed until the Messiah was fully revealed. This is why we don't slaughter animals for sin sacrifices. We don't perform ritual washings for customary impurities. We don't compel anyone to be circumcised. And we don't judge one another on food or drink, or a particular of a new moon or Sabbath. Yet we insist with the Jerusalem Council that all Christians must avoid sexual immorality, things offered to idols, things strangled, and blood. And, with a firm understanding of progressive revelation established, we are ready to learn about our tenth principle of interpretation, which is, in passages that cannot be understood literally, there is a literal meaning confirmed by at least two or three other biblical witnesses, and that literal reading is ultimately what Jesus wants us to understand. Even though Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep, no one who has read the rest of the Bible thinks that Jesus is a literal slab of wood hung on hinges with a handle. By reading the rest of what the Bible has to say, we understand that Jesus is the only way into the kingdom of God and the only way that we can be saved. And in that way only, Jesus resembles a door. Additionally, even though Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. He was not telling us to go home immediately and open our literal front door so he can come in and eat lunch with us today. Nor was he telling us to preach to sinners that Jesus is knocking at the door of their heart and they have to let him in by accepting him as their Savior. No, Jesus told us exactly what the metaphor meant by its context, and especially by the words he said just before the verse I just read. You see, Jesus was speaking to the church in Laodicea when he said, As many as I love I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So, this was said to a church, not to an individual, and Jesus was knocking on their metaphorical door by rebuking and disciplining them. And all they had to do to metaphorically open the door was be zealous and repent. And there's a big difference between accepting Jesus as our Savior compared to zealously repenting and calling Jesus Lord, which means Master. Someone can accept the saving help of a fireman if their house is burning to the ground without submitting to the will and commands of the fireman. But no one can accept the saving help of Jesus Christ without repenting of their sin and submitting to his lordship in their life. So this popular little passage shows us how we must use the literal passages to understand non-literal passages because no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And today I contend, these ten principles of biblical interpretation that the Messiah and his disciples relied on have helped us over the last several weeks consistently and correctly understand the Holy Word of God, from the very first Hebrew word of Genesis to the very last Greek word of Revelation. 